Um, and a welcome to our online worshipers. Special welcome to um, any visitors that are joining us today. So I have two announcements. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to an opportunity this evening. So this evening, starting at 7 o'clock, there'll be a special prayer time for Israel, led by Ben Rancourt. It will be a time of music, testimony, and prayer, and all are welcome. So that's 7 o'clock tonight. And we're going to have a newcomer's service. How cool is that? So let me tell you a little bit about it. If you know someone who you think might um, have an interest in church, but, but perhaps you or them might wonder if they'd be comfortable or um, you know, might feel overwhelmed um, during one of our services, we are having a special service on Sunday, December 3rd, which is the first Sunday of Advent, and it'll be planned specifically for newcomers. The service will be such that a newcomer will feel comfortable with familiar carols and plan for those who may have limited biblical experience, but welcome. So that's very exciting. Um, so now we'll have um, one more of our short videos that is part of the, se the series that we're going through on giving. Hello, I am Bob Weber. This is the Generosity Project, a ministry of the CBWC Foundation. In this video, we will discuss how an orientation to giving is a matter of the condition of our hearts. Our theme verse for the Generosity Project is Luke 6, 38. Give away your life. You'll find it given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. If you study the context of these words, Jesus is certainly talking about money. In verse 34, he mentions that it's not even charity if you give expecting something back. But he's also aiming at a much deeper level. His objective is to get us to be generous in our hearts, and that affects so much more than just our money. Consider verse 36. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind, you be kind. We are to be generous in forgiveness, in overlooking others' faults and being kind in spirit. This moves an understanding of giving far from obeying a command about money that we understand intellectually to cultivating a life spirit patterned after Jesus and the Father. Talking about money in church is not always easy. For pastors and church leaders, it can seem self-serving. But Jesus spoke frequently about money for this very reason. Money is deeply connected to our attitudes and hearts. Giving money touches our hopes, fears, needs, and even greed. The implication of a giving heart go far beyond money to our very being and all of our relationships. It's an important part of walking with God. So I'm reading Psalm 29, a Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. 
The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare, and all in his temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Please pray with me. Our glorious good God of love, power, strength, and grace, you are so big and we are so small. What a blessed miracle it is that you want to be in loving relationship with us. You meet us where we are. You bring your grace, compassion, and strength into our hearts and minds. We are here together in this place and this time to rededicate ourselves to you, to praise you, to worship you, Lord of all. Thank you, Lord, for the way you love us, comfort us, and sustain us. Amen. So please join me in singing hymn 63. If you look in the chairs underneath in front of you, there's a blue book, number 63, All Creatures of Our God and King. Would you stand with us as we sing? Yeah. 
please be seated. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God, both now and forevermore. Amen. As you have come to God in repentance and in confession, may you now experience the fulfillment of his promises in these moments and in the days to come. For we remember that God has spoken through the Apostle Paul, saying, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Amen? Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. All right. Well, if the kids are free to head on out to Adventure Time, have fun. Oops. And uh, for those of us here, uh, we are entering into the time of the prayers of our community, which is our time to bring before God uh, any thanksgivings we may have to give to the Lord, uh, any uh, ask for his intercession or help, or any word of encouragement that the Lord might have given you throughout the week that you think he might be calling you to share um, with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I have one right off the beginning. Um, many of you know that um, Courtney, this is um, Maureen's daughter, was in Spain for surgery, and um, she was expected back yesterday, but I've just learned that there was... Um, uh, delay in the whole flight thing so she won't get back until sometime today so just keep praying for her as she's trying to recover from surgery and <laughs> dealing with delays in travel um, so we'll pray for Courtney but for those of you who hadn't heard the surgery went well so praise the Lord for that but others any requests or thanksgivings or words of encouragement All right, let's pray. Would you bow with me, please? Gracious Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you through, that your, through your Son, Jesus Christ, and our faith in him, you have adopted us into one family, and that we can honestly and truly pray and call you Father because, what have you, what, because of what you have done through your Son. And so, Father, as your children, we come to you now and... We give you thanks. We recognize that uh, we have not only great promise uh, through you and your son, but we also have um, great blessing here and now. And so we give you thanks. And Heavenly Father, we recognize that we are all uh, in your hands. Um, we thank you for the promise that you have given us through Jesus, that we will be raised on the last day, but we thank you also for the care that you show us even now, the ways that you direct us with your wisdom, that you heal us with your power, and that you guide us by your spirit. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you in all things and in all ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. So I'm going to invite Greg to come up, and Greg is going to read selections from the story of Noah and the Flood. Uh, we read the whole thing last week, um, so uh, he's going to read bits and pieces, and then we're going to go from there. 
<laughs> so I invite you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> so we all turned our clocks back an hour so we were here in very good time. For the scripture reading, we're winding the clock back one whole week. So as uh, Grant just introduced, there will be sections of the reading that we did last week that uh, are, they're all listed in your order of service, so if you can follow along, uh, I'm not going to need to introduce each section. <clears throat> so Genesis chapter 6, starting at verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the, gr the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how it is to be built. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth and destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. You will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you, two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. For 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and, incre and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains, to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had a breath of life in it, in its nostrils, died. Every li living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. And the waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth 
and the waters receded. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. All the animals and all the creatures that move along the, gro the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the land, came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, and we thank you for this story um, that is a story of new beginnings. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to hear and understand what you have written in your word, that we might find joy in submitting our lives to you and find the goodness and grace that comes from your wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember having dinner with the family of a successful businessman a while ago. Um, I was from out of town, I was somewhere else, and I had no idea what this person actually did for business. I just know they had done well. And so I just asked him, well, what do you do? And he began listing a number of ventures that he had been involved with over the years. And as he was talking, his mother who was there cut in and said, don't waste time telling him about all the things that didn't work. Just tell him about the one thing that did work, right? And I think that's a pretty good way of summarizing a lot of our present day attitudes, right? We don't want to hear what doesn't work. We want to cut straight to hearing about the things that does work. We want the stories of success, not stories of failure. We want stories of salvation, not stories of judgment. And we suffer for it. We suffer greatly because we do not value warning. Now last week, I left you with two questions to consider as you listened to the story of Noah and the ark. First, why does God want us to know that the flood doesn't fix things, right? The problem with the human heart that prompted the flood is not fixed at the end of the story, you might remember. So I asked, why does God want us to know that? And second, I asked, what is it that God introduces in this story for the very first time in the Bible that actually does make a difference, right? Even though the problem that prompted the flood isn't solved in the end, somehow this story still has a happy ending. What caused that? Now, the answer to the second question, that is what makes the difference, definitely receives the emphasis in this story, as it should. At the very center of the story of Noah and the ark in chapter eight, verse one, we're told that God remembered someone. Who was it that God remembered, anybody? Noah, yes, that's right. And why, here's the digging a little deeper, why bring Noah rather than someone else the game changer? I mean, it's not like God had no knowledge of all the other people who were wiped out by the flood. So what was it about Noah that he remembered that made the difference? Anyone? He was righteous. Yes, that's a big part of it. Yes, who said that? Anyway. Anyway. 
Yeah, amen. It was the covenant. This is the first time in the Bible the word covenant is ever used. Uh, this is the first covenant relationship we see expressly established. Uh, we see it starting in chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Where we read, the Lord is speaking here, he says, I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on the earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. So the reason why Noah and those with him in the ark were saved was because God established a covenant relationship with Noah. That was the game changer. And so this is a story of salvation through covenant relationship. That's the new thing that's introduced for the first time that makes the difference in this story. So the reason why Noah and those with him didn't perish, uh, along with everyone else, is because of this covenant relationship he had with God. And on account of this relationship, life on earth was saved by God, even though what was wrong with the human heart still needed to be fixed, even though Noah's heart hadn't been changed yet. So, this is the story about a beginning. Genesis 1, uh, like we're doing through this whole series, all of Genesis 1 through 11 are stories about beginnings. You might remember Genesis 1 was the story of the beginning of everything, especially the beginning of life on earth. Genesis 2 was the beginning of what life is all about, that is, relationships, particularly our own relationship with God and with each other. Genesis 3 was then the beginning of how things went wrong, right? that we broke faith with God, we proved ourselves untrustworthy. And now with the story of Noah and the ark, uh, we find an important story of beginnings again, that this is the story of the beginning of how God is going to make it all right again. This is where it begins. Remember, God promised Eve immediately after the fall into sin that he would save the world through one of her descendants, her seed. Well, with Noah, for the first time, it's revealed how God will save the world through this seed. That he will do it through covenant relationship. I think, well, people ask me this. I don't know if they ask you this, but the question comes up fairly frequently. How does Jesus save us? Right? How is it that Jesus saves? And one of the shortest answers to that question, although it requires some unpacking, but one of the shortest answers is, Jesus kept covenant. That's how Jesus saved like Noah, who obeyed all of God's commands about the ark and was thereby saved by God along with his family and, creation, and the creatures with him. In a far greater way, Jesus obeyed his heavenly Father in everything, even into laying down his own life on the cross. And this obedience of Jesus, this keeping of covenant, that has, has made a way of salvation for more than just Jesus. Just like Noah got to bring his family in the ark with him too, so Jesus gets his fa- to bring his family along as well. This is why Jesus is so keen to adopt you into his family. Because through faith in him, you get to enter the ark with him and be saved from the flood of the final judgment that will come upon the earth. As the Apostle Peter himself writes in 1 Peter chapter 3, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. As the covenant keeper, Jesus traveled safely through the waters of God's judgment upon human sin and into resurrection life. And everyone who was adopted into Jesus' family through faith in him, this faith expressed in baptism, will also safely travel through the waters of judgment and into resurrection life. Even though we aren't the ones who kept the covenant, even though we sinned, we're like Noah's kids who gets saved along with Noah, not because of what we have done, but because of what Noah has done. And thus, we too are saved by grace, not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. Jesus kept covenant. 
Now, next Sunday, when we come to Genesis chapter 9, where the covenant that God makes with Noah is unpacked in greater detail, we're going to look more closely at this covenant relationship. But before we get there, I wanted to take some time today to spend, um, to pay attention to the other side of things, the things that didn't work. You see, the part that worked gets attention, and that's a good thing, and I wanted to get attention. We'll give it attention next week. That's the covenant. But there's also important things about the flood that reveal things that didn't work. Now, you may remember that the beginning of the story of Genesis that was read to us again this morning, Genesis 6 verse 5, God himself told us what the root problem that was responsible for him having to bring the flood was. In chapter 6 verse 5, we read, that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And then God himself again tells us at the end of the story, in chapter 8, verse 21, that this problem with the human heart has not been fixed yet. We read it in eight. Chapter 8, verse 21, where it says, The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, that is, the aroma of Moses' sacrifice, so he accepts the covenant, and that's what makes the difference. He says, because of this, he says, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. So the heart part hasn't changed yet. So God's covenant relationship with Noah saved life on the earth, but it didn't address the root problem yet. It didn't heal the human heart. Why does God want us to know this? Well, I believe it's because God wants to expose things that cannot save us. The salvation that God brought about through Noah was good, but it was not enough. Not until we get to Jesus do we get to someone who can actually fix the root problem, who can heal the human heart. And again, we will see this next week in chapter 9. Um... But we'll also see you next week in chapter 9, at the end of it, that Noah and his family are already caught up in sin again. The heart problem has been fixed, and we start to see sin manifest itself already, without any, even one generation passing. In other words, the flood is something that I think represents what many of us may consciously or unconsciously believe will fix things, but actually doesn't. God takes the very best, most righteous family on earth. Think about this. The very, very best family on earth and wipes out every other person, every hint of wickedness apart from the most righteous person on the planet, and starts things over again. Thus, the story of Noah is the ultimate story of starting over. It is the most radical second chance story ever. And God wants you and I to know that second chances never work. Starting over never, ever fixes things in the end. Never. A second chance, yes, can offer a temporary relief, as I'm sure it did for Noah and his family. But second chances never address the root problem, that the world out there is sick because every single human heart is sick. The flood represents every attempt at salvation that stops short of addressing what has really gone wrong at the root of things, the human heart. The flood, in a sense, is God's firm no to all attempts to make the world a better place that want to skip over the transformation of the heart. When it comes to salvation, a heart bypass never works. Never. Yet I think we are all tempted by the thought that we can make the world a better place, we can save it, without people's hearts needing to change. And I think there are at least four ways we try to do this. There are at least four ways we believe that a flood alone can still work. First, as I've already mentioned, we believe in second chances. In fact, there are preachers out there who preach that God is a God of second chances. I think this kind of preaching is a real disservice to Christians. It corrupts Christian teaching on forgiveness and eventually leads people into despair. Why? Because a second chance is simply an opportunity to try again. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, God could give each one of us a million opportunities to try again at keeping his covenant, and we would fail every time, just like Noah's family failed again right after the flood. 
And what makes me so sad is when Christians believe that God's forgiveness of their sin is simply a second chance. It makes me so sad because I used to believe this. And it led me to some of the darkest places I've ever been in my life. It's easy to believe that all you need is a second chance when you've only failed one, two, or maybe three times to keep a command of the Lord. But if you fail to keep one of his commands hundreds or even thousands of times as I have, then the idea that all that God gives us in forgiveness is a second chance is the most horribly depressing thought that can ever fill your heart. Because if you failed that many times, you know, like I know, that unless God changes your heart, the desires inside of you that you have no power to change, that you're just going to fail again. If all you're going to get is simply a chance to do it over, then why even bother coming to God at all for forgiveness? Why waste his time when you're just going to screw it up again? That is the despair of second chance thinking. And I've been there. I spent most of my teens and early 20s wrestling with whether I could even ever come back to God because I failed so many times. Praise the Lord. He revealed good, to, good news to me in the end that I didn't know. Because God is not giving anyone any second chances. He only gives one new beginning. That's it. And that's all you'll ever need. One new beginning. In the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 7, we read this. It says, Unlike other high priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sin and then for the sins of the people. Listen to this. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself on the cross. All sins for all people once. When you put your faith in Jesus, all of your sin, past, present, and future, was covered once and completely when he offered himself on the cross. Our continuing practice of confessing our sins and receiving assurance of our forgiveness is precisely for that, to receive the assurance and to remain in a humble and right relationship with Christ. Because God already forgave you your 1,000 failings on the very first day you put your faith in him. He gave you a new beginning that should always make you quick to come back to him whenever you fail or fall. He did not give you a second chance to go out there and try to get it right next time because floods don't fix the problem. Second chances don't work. Only your covenant relationship with God that gives you a new beginning can do that. So first, the flood teaches that second chances don't work. They are not how God saves us. Instead, God is bringing about one new great beginning. But second, we also learn that simply getting rid of all the bad people in the world doesn't work either. I think this is often an unconscious and unspoken hope that we have, but I think it's incredibly prevalent in our culture and unfortunately within the church. More and more people today's hope for justice seems to be centered around getting rid of particular people like Vladimir Putin or getting rid of certain types of people like racists or bullies. The current cancel culture thrives on the hope that lives in the hearts of more and more people today that if we just got rid of or at least silenced this particular type of person, then the world would be a better place. The story of the flood says a firm no to this kind of thinking. It demonstrates that at one time, God literally got rid of every evil person in the world except for the most righteous person on earth. And yet his immediate family didn't get it right after the flood. Not even one generation passed before sin sparked up again and the violence and wickedness that comes with it. God's point is simply that getting rid of people doesn't work. It doesn't fix things. You could lock up every racist in prison and it would not bring an end to racism. Because the problem isn't a few bad apples who ruin the bunch. 
The problem is that every human heart is inclined towards evil, and floods can't fix that. It should be greatly comforting to us that the Almighty God who created us does not think that getting rid of people like us is the answer. That should be a very comforting thought, right? And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, neither should we ever think that getting rid of people is the answer. Let's never set our hopes on that. We pray that God would change people's hearts. We hope for Jesus' healing power to change the hearts of racists and bullies and Vladimir Putin and lead them on paths of repentance and reconciliation. And part of the reason why we believe this is because the flood demonstrates that removing bad people from the world simply doesn't work. It doesn't address the root problem. All right, third, we also don't believe that changing culture will save the world. This is the hope that if only righteous people like Noah were the influencers of society and in key leadership positions within the culture, then the world would be a better place. But this too is a false hope, a hope that is dashed right from the very beginning by God with the story of the flood. You may remember that the time before the flood saw humankind descending further and further into violence and sin until only Noah was left and God then brought a sudden reversal of, with the flood. That is, it looked like evil was going to win until God stepped in and saved Noah. And the Bible as a whole pictures the time between the flood and the final judgment as a replaying of that descent into wickedness culminating in a final and dramatic reversal brought about by God who belong to the new Noah, Jesus Christ. In other words, God does not present a picture of cultural influence leading to righteousness. Cultural influence tends the other direction, towards wickedness, because the human heart tends in the same direction. Yes, God brings times of revival along the way, and we should pray for revival in our time. But that revival is not brought about by the cultural maneuvering of getting Christians into places of power and influence to, improve, to impose Christian practices and beliefs upon people who don't believe them. The root problem is not culture, it's the human heart. And thus the goal of the church is not cultural influence, but the Great Commission. We exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we exist to do. Our goal is to bring people to the one person, Jesus Christ, who can do what actually needs to be done, who can change the heart. We don't fight for cultural dominance, we fight for people's hearts, whoever may dominate culture. Motivated by the love and forgiveness we have first received from Christ, we work together to bear witness to the new life that is available to all in Christ. And your part in that witness is just as important as mine. I may do more talking about Jesus than you do, but God saved life on the earth through Noah, and Noah didn't do any talking at all. I don't know if you noticed that in the Noah story. Noah never talks. He just obeyed God. It is not your cultural influence that is precious to God. It's your obedience. The lowliest person who obeys the Lord does infinitely more than the most famous or powerful Christian who fails to obey. Don't put false hope in the idea that you have to become someone influential before you make a difference for Christ. Just obey him, no matter how trivial or insignificant that may seem to others. All right, so to sum up here, second chances don't save. Getting rid of bad people doesn't save. Influencing culture does not save. And finally, saying everything is okay does not save. It does not make things better. Second, only to its emphasis on the importance of covenant relationship with God. The thing the flood says most clearly is that everything is definitely not okay with the world. You don't flood the entire earth when there's only a little problem. God's choice to bring about the flood so that as we read in chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, sorry, let me find it here, that everything on the dry land that had the breath of its life in its nostrils died. 
Everything living on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. That is not evidence of a little problem that will go away on its own. That is evidence of a very, very big problem. People who don't enter into the ark are not going to be okay. This is incredibly unpopular news. This, I think, is what we really, really don't want to hear. This is the kind of news when it comes up in the scriptures, we want to interrupt and say, don't waste time telling people about what didn't succeed about the judgment. Just skip ahead to what does work, that through Jesus we're saved. But as hard as it is to hear, it is the news that God wants us to hear and to take to heart right from the very beginning of the Bible. Universalism. The belief that God's love is so big that everyone will get saved in the end is not true. Scripture tells us that God desires all people to save. God's love is big. But right from the beginning of the Bible, Scripture makes it clear that if you don't go inside the ark, you will not survive the flood. Today, entrance into the ark happens through faith in Jesus Christ symbolically expressed through choosing to go through the waters of baptism. Through faith, we are adopted into Jesus' family and find ourselves metaphorically in, his, in the ark with him. And those with Jesus will pass through the final judgment with him and into the resurrection life that waits on the other side. But those who do not enter the ark before God closes the door, that is, before their life on this earth is through, will not survive the flood of the final judgment that's coming. The story of Noah and the ark brings us the good news that even though we're sinners, people with sick hearts, we can be saved through covenant relationship, the covenant that Jesus fulfilled. No one is too lost to be saved. That is good news, and it's in this story. But the story of Noah and the ark also brings the sobering news that we need to enter the ark before the door closes. For the flood teaches that no one is saved by a second chance, only by a new beginning in Christ. Nor is the world fixed by trying to get rid of the bad people. God's expressed desire is to save bad people, not get rid of them, and that should be our desire too. Nor is the world fixed by trying to influence culture. Revival is the result of humble obedience, not cultural influence. And finally, saying everything is okay does not help, it doesn't save. Because the flood demonstrates that things are not going to be okay for everybody. There is a way to be saved, yes. Everyone who has faith in Jesus has entered into covenant relationship with him, has entered metaphorically into the ark. But the sobering news of the Bible, from here at its beginning, all the way to its very end, is that no one who fails to enter the ark before the door closes survives. No one. And so, my brothers and sisters, let us ensure that we ourselves have entered in. And having examined our own lives, may we then fan into flame the gifts that God has given us, that we may help as many people as possible enter in with us. Amen? Amen. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are right up front straight from the beginning. Father, we recognize that what is wrong with the world is not a simple problem. It is a very serious problem. And Father, we thank you that when we had no way to fix it ourselves, even when the most righteous person on earth, Noah, couldn't fix it by his own hand, that you stepped forward in your mercy and you established a covenant with him. And through that covenant, you saved him and those with him. And Father, we thank you that that set up the model which has been fulfilled to its fullness through your son, Jesus Christ, who has established a new covenant that deals with the root problem, the problem of sin that dwells within our hearts. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to always submit ourselves to your son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord. For we recognize that it is with him that we are saved and that there is no hope outside of him. We pray that you would gather more and more people into his family. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. We're going to close by singing hymn number 609. This is number 609, No Not One. Would you please stand with me as we sing? So my brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the gifts of the story of the flood is that it kills our false hopes. It kills our hopes in things that cannot save so that we can finally see how incredible the way God saves us actually is. That through the covenant that he establishes and brings to fruition in Jesus Christ, there's a really big ark that can fit everyone who wants to come in. And so may you go in the knowledge that through Jesus Christ you have entered into the ark with him. And may you obey Christ through, through your simple obedience of him. You will help him 
lead more and more people into that ark. Go now in peace and serve your Lord. Amen.